Welcome to our service today. Tomorrow we celebrate Memorial Day and remember and recognize those who served our country and gave their lives in their service. We're going to begin by singing together number 571, My Country Tis of Thee. The lyrics will be on the screen. And we're going to sing verses 1 and 4. Would you please stand and let's sing together. <laughs> Join me now in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and then singing our national anthem. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Father in heaven, the remains of our sons and daughters lie in graves from right here in Cold Harbor all the way to Manila and Normandy and points, all points in between, where the ultimate sacrifice was made for freedom. Lord, on this weekend, on tomorrow's most somber of holidays, may we be reminded again of the fact that freedom is not free. May we rejoice and give you thanks that because of their sacrifice, we can do what we're doing right now, worship, pray, fellowship, with no hindrance and no compulsion because of the freedom we have as Americans. May we never take that for granted. May we never take that lightly. Father, may we also use our freedoms not to just do whatever we want to do, but to do the most important tasks you've given us, your will, serving others, and telling this world about Jesus. We are free men and women, and we have a Lord and Savior who brings freedom for eternity. May we have the courage and boldness to share that freedom with a very hurting a very lost world. Lord, we again bow before you today in humble gratitude for inspiring and empowering men and women throughout the history of this nation to give their all. May we give our all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we focus now on the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross, and as we prepare our hearts for communion, let's sing together number 441, Take Time to Be Holy, the first two verses. Enter this weekend, uh, Memorial Day weekend, we think about those that gave the last full measure, their life for our freedom. And a lot of times, you know, war brings up questions, and we want, we want answers to questions. When we see the events that happened in Texas um, last week, we want answers, we, we, and we seek answers. And I would suggest we not seek men and women for answers. Our elected officials, as well-intentioned as possible, we don't seek answers from them. We need to seek no farther, no further than Jesus Christ for answers to these questions. Jesus tells us quite clearly, he tells his followers that in this world you will have trouble, but to take heart, I've overcome the world. He has overcome the world. The fact, the answer for our problems is Jesus Christ God in the flesh left his throne in paradise, came down to his creation, lived a perfect, sinless life, died on a cross, was buried in a grave, in a tomb, and after parts of three days was risen from the dead. 
and we put our trust and faith in him and make him our Lord and Savior, we don't look, need to look for answers anywhere else. We'll have concerns and tribulations here, but ultimately we have life eternal because the answer we're searching for needs to be searched no farther than Jesus Christ. I've shared this with a couple of folks last Sunday, well, a few Sundays ago on Mother's Day. I was coming to church, and as I get dressed, the last thing I do is I lace up my shoes, I tie my shoes, and my shoelace broke. And I was like, oh, gone. And I was literally, I'm, I'm like out the door. So I had an older pair of shoes that these had replaced, and I was like, well, nobody looks at my shoes. I'll just wear those to church. It won't be a big deal. So I got in the parking lot, started walking across the parking lot into the church, and I felt something in my shoe, a pebble or something, I thought. So I said hi to the preacher, walked into the office, took my shoe off, and dumped out the wedding ring I had lost over three years ago, had been in my shoe the entire time. And I was convinced it was gone forever. I'd been on an appointment that week, and I'd gotten wet, and I thought uh, the ring fell off. I went back to the site, went back under the house, went into the parking lot, not there. Evidently, when I took my, clo my dirty clothes off and put them in my clothes hamper, the ring fell out into my old ratty pair of shoes right by the clothes hamper. But truth be known, I had stopped looking. I had given up looking for my ring. But the ring was always there. The ring was sitting there in my shoe for over three years. Christ, the answer to our questions, is there. He is always there waiting for us, willing for us to come to him. And on a Sunday when we're here, this is probably preaching to the converted, but we have many folks outside of these walls that are looking for an answer. And I would argue, and I would win the argument, they need to look no farther than Jesus Christ. The world wants to offer lots of answers to all our questions. And not to get too far into the weeds, but I was watching a, an event Hanover County Board of Supervisors meeting rebroadcast. And as I, and as I watched our elected officials, um, some of them speak, um, a, a verse came to mind from Proverbs. And King Solomon wrote, when words are many, sin is not absent. But a, but a wise man holds his tongue. And as I listened to some of those politicians offer their advice and their great words of, words, words of wisdom, I thought, they don't have the answers. Those folks do not have the answers for us and never will. Jesus Christ has the answer, life eternal, when we make him our Lord and Savior. And another one of the Proverbs that came to mind, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And when Solomon's talking about a fool, he's not talking about a dumb dumb or, or, or an idiot. He's talking about someone who is morally deficient, a fool. We don't need to listen to fools. We need to look no further for answers to answers in this world and the world to come than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise God for him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we, we thank you for what you have done for us. You died on a cross. You offer us the answer for life eternal. When we make you our Lord and Savior, you give us that through grace. And we, and we are just so blessed and thank you for that. Lord, when I pray, I'm going to pray that you please forgive me for my sins. And when I let you down on a daily basis, Lord, help me to be a better Christian husband, a better Christian father, and a better Christian to everyone I can come in contact with. So in my small way, in our way, we can show the light of life, and that's your son, the answer, Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. On the night that, of the Last Supper, the night that Jesus would be betrayed, Matthew gives this eyewitness account to the Last Supper when he records these words. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. <clears throat> Matthew 
Matthew continues his eyewitness account of the Last Supper by recording these words. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. How many of you are glad that Fred's marriage was saved? How many of you are? Uh, <laughs> I was pretty excited about that. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, wonderful thoughts on the Lord's Supper today. You know, this, is a, uh, this has been a tough month for our nation, hasn't it? Uh, month started off with, uh, you know, a, a mass shooting in a, in a supermarket in Buffalo, racially motivated and hate-filled. Hate Hatred is demonstrated in California when someone goes into a church and, and murders uh, one person there. And then what happens on Tuesday? If you, if you, you know, we're friends on Facebook, you saw what I probably said on Wednesday. You know, Wednesday I woke up and Betsy always gets ready and goes and all that stuff and then, you know, whatever. And uh, I always hear the garage door close and that's when I know, you know, she's on her way. And I heard the door, go, I heard the garage door close on Wednesday and I knew that she was headed off to an elementary school on the other side of Henrico County, and I just, just my, you know, my heart just gets that little bit of, you know, little pit in your stomach kind of feeling, and as moms and dads are putting their children on buses at the same time, and as um, kids get in their own cars and drive off to their high school or whatever, it, it just, the murder of 19 children and their teachers, uh, hurts us like nothing I can even articulate. So I knew today that um, we'd want to have a time of prayer. I get a little tired of the folks, and it's all, you know, it's folks constantly on social media or on your favorite news channel who's, who will sometimes pipe up and say, thoughts and prayers are not enough. We need to do something. And they're right. We do need to do something. I don't know. I'm like Fred. I don't know what we need to do. I'm, I'm not the one that has the answers for what this nation needs to do. But I do know we need to pray. And it starts with prayer. It may not be the only thing that we do, but it is the most important thing that we do. And we pray for healing, and we pray for answers, and we pray for the changes that need to be made. But we will pray. So I invited the, the elders who are in this particular service, if they would uh, come and join me here at the front, and we're going we're gonna to pray together. Uh, as for, we're going to all pray together. Um, I'm going to give them a microphone. That's not for God to hear. That's for you to hear and be able to follow along with them in, our, in their prayers. So, I'm going to ask you all to pray, and then I'll, I'll close our time. I don't know who's going to be on the end, so I'll just start it down on the end, and then I'll close in prayer. I'll, I'll close that. Would you pray with me? Father, in times like these, quite honestly, I don't have the words. Uh, I don't even know what to say. Um, I'm reminded of uh, a couple of stanzas from Taps that was just played. Rest in peace, comrade dear, for God is near. Um, a lot of people met you face to face. They were snuffed out in life prematurely. And Father, I know that uh, they rest in you. And the people that are left behind that have to suffer with these circumstances, I pray that they will feel your presence and your love. Father, this, this nation, as, as the world, is literally going to the devil. What is right is wrong, and what is wrong is right now. Father, we are your ambassadors. We are your followers. We are people that love you. Father, I ask for courage and strength for me and for every person in this room and every Christian that walks, 
for any moment and any chance they have that they'll stand for your son. Forgive us, Father, that we took you out of schools. We're doing our best to take you out of everything. The church is even being attacked. Give us strength and courage and boldness. And please, Father, help these people. In Christ's name. Father God, ever since I've heard of this tragic shooting in Texas, my heart has been broken. Uh, like Rick, thinking about the teachers going off to school, being nervous because of what could happen. The children and their parents who put them on buses thinking they're going to come home safe, only to find out that their children aren't coming back home. Their husbands and wives aren't coming back home. And Father, it does lead to many questions. Questions that, as humans, as hard as we try, we never seem to find the correct answer. But we know in your word, we know in your heart, there is an answer. And Father, if we would listen closely, and if we would follow what you tell us, that answer would be apparent. Father, this nation is suffering from something far worse than crime, racial tax, murders. We have a big sin problem, and they all come together in that. And Father, if we realize that our sin is our issue, then we'd be able to fix it. But Father, we know that's not going to happen in this life. We know that you've already told us about wars and rumors of wars and so many things that we can expect. But one day, Father, your son will come back, and it will all be taken care of. Father, I pray for strength for this nation, wisdom for our people, kindness, love, graciousness. And Father, I pray for the families in this country. None of these things happen in a vacuum. All of these things happen because someone was neglected as a child or mistreated as a child or mistreated by friends and family and students and other students. And Father, we know that uh, that plays heavily on the mind. And Father, I pray that that can be taken care of, that things like social media will calm down and people will stop hurting each other online and then acting like they didn't do it because they couldn't be seen when they did it. Father, help us to find answers. Help us to find wisdom. In the name of Christ, I pray. Father God, your word says that we don't know how to pray. This is certainly one of those times I don't have the words to comfort these families that have lost the most important and precious thing in their life. But your word also tells us that the Holy Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf with groans that cannot be understood. We ask that he do so on our behalf this day. Amen. Father God, um, we can pass a million laws and get rid of the internet and get rid of every phone and Lord, that won't solve the problem because ultimately what people need is Jesus. They need Jesus. They need Jesus. So inspire and challenge your church across this fruited plain and around the world to tell people about Jesus. Father, right here in our own community, may we help us, help us to keep our eyes open for uh, folks who are lonely, who are on the margins, um, who are sad and depressed. And Lord, help us to get them the help, help us to embrace them, to show them love, and to get them the help that they need. They're all around us. And Father, today, just right here in this very community in which we live, I pray you put a hedge of protection around public schools and private schools and Christian schools and home schools. Uh, protect them from the evil one who would go in to, to do violence and much more. Thank you for those who rush into those places and give them wisdom and strength to do their jobs and to do them well. Forgive us when we have perpetuated the things in this culture that bring about such evil. 
heal our land. And finally, Lord, come quickly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. I'm going to transition to the pulpit. Um, we are one nation under God. We are one church under God, indivisible. Uh, why don't we just take a moment while I'm going up there, just to take a moment and greet the folks around you. If you want to stand up, you can, or if you just want to turn and just say hi to the folks that are worshiping around you right now. Our preaching team talked about this last uh, week, whether we wanted to continue on Sundays talking about joy. Uh, you know, it seems like kind of, a, kind of a rough time to be talking about joy. And then we said, what better time to be talking about joy? So we continue our, our sermon series on our quest, our, our daily quest for joy. I want to tell you about you know, seeing joy firsthand uh, this past week. Uh, every Monday morning, our, uh, uh, we have here that meets at the church our Caring Hearts and Hands group. And the Caring Hearts and Hands group, I don't, I don't know if there are any guys, so I'm going to say there are, are a lot of women uh, who uh, come up here on Monday mornings and they sew and they knit and they cro croquet, crochet, what is it, what is it, what is it, crochet, I, I always get the two mixed up, I, I, yeah, I, I wish they were playing croquet up here on Monday mornings, that'd be fun. But they make all this stuff and that, that goes to hospitals, that goes to, um, goes to uh, Operation Christmas Child packages, that go to homeless folks through Moments of Hope. Uh, they make prayer blankets. They make things for folks uh, who are at home who need, who need warm. I mean, it's an amazing ministry of making things for, um, uh, for our community and hurting people and, and people in need. And they do a great job. And, and they have a lot of fellowship. It's a lot of fun. Well, Monday was a really special one. This past Monday was a really special one because Monday was also also, Miss Marjorie's 101st birthday. Miss Marjorie's 101. And they were all in cahoots. She didn't know it, uh, but they were all in cahoots. They, uh, they had a little birthday party planned uh, for Miss Marjorie. And so she, came, she was picked up, brought in a little bit late. And when Miss Marjorie walked in, her face demonstrated unbridled joy. It wasn't just happiness, although there was certainly happiness there. It was something much deeper. Uh, the room was decorated all in pink. Uh, there were balloons. There was a cake. There was a brunch buffet. Can I get an amen? Um, the staff came in. We all sang happy birthday, and it was a tremendous uh, moment of celebration. Uh, but Miss Marjorie demonstrated for all of us what joy really looks like. Joy is a precious state of mind. It's better than happiness, and it lasts much longer. True joy is not determined by our circumstances. It's determined by our personal relationship with Jesus. When the time came for Marjorie to blow out her candles, and no, we did not have 101 candles. That would have been against the law. We couldn't do that. Uh, she had three candles, and when it came time to blow them out, you always do the make a wish. And Miss Marjorie didn't make a wish. Miss Marjorie prayed, and she prayed out loud. It was obvious that her joy was not in cake or balloons. Her joy is in the love of God displayed by her friends and fellow Christians there in that room. It was true joy. Am I right, Miss Marjorie? It was true joy. Joy is one manifestation of God's Spirit in our lives. The Apostle Paul gives that powerful lesson in his letter to the Galatians that we experience God's Spirit in our lives in a number of ways. He mentions nine ways. I'm sure there are many others, but he says that, that the Spirit manifests itself in our lives through love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. You probably memorized those as a child. If we are allowing God's Spirit in us to truly direct our lives, if we're allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us on a daily basis, then that fruit will be evident in our lives. But that doesn't mean that we don't struggle from time to time allowing the Spirit to manifest itself. Sometimes circumstances in life make some of that fruit a challenge. And you all know what I mean. Our kids, maybe our parents even, sometimes they wear on our, what, patience. 
that obnoxious co-worker tests every ounce of our kindness. The candy that dominates every checkout counter in America attacks our self-control. In this current sermon series, we're considering the challenges to our joy. The quest for joy often involves a number of obstacles. Seth talked to us last week about uh, the spirit of, cri- uh, of criticism. A critical spirit often wins the wrestling match with the Holy Spirit. Criticism is an obstacle to our quest for joy. Another one of those obstacles is busyness, and I want to just talk to you very briefly about that today. Leadership guru John Maxwell writes, the greatest enemy of good thinking is busyness. Pastor John Decker says, I wanted to figure out why I was so busy, but I couldn't find the time to do it. Now, busyness is a tricky one. Because in many ways, we kind of wear busyness like a badge of honor. I've said on many occasions when folks went, hey, how's everything? Hey, everything's good, but I'm busy. And then I'll say these words. I'll often say, well, but you know, I'd rather be busy than bored. I'm not sure that's a good thing. I'm not sure that busyness is the goal. I'm not sure that busyness is the accurate opposite of boredom. Scripture instructs us to work hard, tells us to be busy at work. We know that work is important to us as individuals, and the Bible extols the virtue of hard work. The whole book of Ecclesiastes, that, that's, all, that's, that's one of the themes of the book of Ecclesiastes. It's one of the themes of the book of Proverbs. King Solomon extols the virtues of hard work. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. In other words, work hard at whatever you choose to do. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, he says, we hear that some among you are idle. They're not busy, they're busy bodies, he says. Work is good, but we fill our lives with work, recreation, taking care of our family, taking care of our yard, entertainment, hobbies, service work, even church work. Our lives are a constant running to-do list. And then when we aren't doing We're scrolling our phones or we're on our computer on social media seeing what everybody else is doing. I had a friend tell me this week that they had purposely cut back on a lot of things in their life. They just, you know, there's some things they need to cut back on, they cut back on them. It wasn't easy to do because they were good things. But this is the realization that he had this week. It wasn't long before he realized he had filled that time with other good things. It simply feels as if we're wired this way, that it seems like it's human nature, or at the very least, it's American nature. Scripture instructs us to work hard, but Scripture also warns against misplacing our priorities. And then we have a perfect example from the Gospels from the life of Jesus. Familiar story, but it kicks me every time I read it. Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She was busy. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. Jesus doesn't condemn Martha's work. He doesn't condemn her busyness. What he condemns is her misplaced priorities. Her busyness had led to worry. Her busyness had led to upsetness. And those things crowd out joy. This kind of busyness has two unavoidable results. First, busyness blocks our joy in the Lord. Now, the book of Psalms has more to say about joy than any other book in the Bible. Now, it's also one of the biggest books in the Bible, but even proportionally, it has more to say about joy than any other book of the Bible. If joy is something you feel lacking, let me encourage you to read the book of Psalms. Now, it also has a lot of lament. It has a lot of sadness, but it is a great book to read to understand biblical, godly joy. David, he writes in Psalm 19, the precepts, the the, the commands of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. 
He says in Psalm 28, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy and I'll give thanks to him in song. True, everlasting, and unfading joy is not found in our work. It's not found in our achievements. It's not found in our pursuits. The Bible says true, everlasting, unfading joy is found in the Lord. If busyness is robbing me of joy, then it's most likely that it's hindering my relationship with God. We also see busyness blocking us from our joy in serving others. You'll remember in Jesus' teaching, he tells his listeners to love their neighbor. And someone wisely said, well, who is my neighbor? And this is when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. You're familiar with that. A man is robbed and beaten and left to die on the side of the road. And who comes by but a priest comes by, keeps on walking. A Levite comes by, keeps on walking. But then a Samaritan, a hated Samaritan comes by. And he's the one to help. All encountered the same victim. But their behavior was not all the same, was it? Three travelers. Jesus is, of course, overarching point to that parable is that we are to help those who we don't like. We're to, we're to, we're to love everyone. We're to love our neighbor regardless of whether they like us or we like them. But you cannot help but miss the modern, kind of the modern visual. When you visualize that parable happening, you have three busy men traveling the road. They got somewhere to be. They got something to do. They got people to see. I don't have time for that. Only one has, only one takes the time to serve. Busyness blocks the joy that we find in the Lord. And busyness blocks the joy we find and we experience in serving others. So we're on this quest for joy. We want to exhibit the fruit that God so much wants in our lives, wants to cultivate in our lives. We're dealing with criticism. We're embracing a life of building up rather than one of tearing down. But we also need to deal with busyness. So how do we do that? Do we just burn our calendars? Do we uh, just throw our phones in the river somewhere so we're not burdened by all that anymore? Do we, do we give up everything? I, maybe, maybe. I think Jesus gives us the direction to finding joy in this life. I think he gives us the best direction in his Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount helps us to understand what a spirit-filled life looks like. This spirit-filled life leads to the joy that we all so desperately want to make sure we have in our lives. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, verse 31. He says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all those things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Now hold it there for just a second. Isn't that what busyness really is? As we saw with Martha, it's a manifestation of worry. Busyness may be other things as well, but most often I think it's worry. I have to make ends meet. I have to prepare for my retirement. Well, I have to do what everyone else is doing, otherwise no one will like me. My kids need to do what all the other kids are doing so they'll be popular. I have to fill my life with lots of stuff so my life will have meaning. It's all a manifestation of worry. Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus gives us the road map to joy. The road to joy is found in setting priorities. Seek first. That's a priority. Maybe you've been to a t-ball game that had this happen, or you saw one on America's favorite videos, or you saw it on the internet or something, but you've all seen it probably happen. Uh, a t-ball game, a little fella gets up, they put the ball on the tee, and whack, uh, he hits that ball, and he starts running, and where does he run? He runs the third base. You know, you ever seen that? You know what I mean? You ever seen that? And chaos ensues, boy. Everybody goes, no, run the first, and he's, he's just running all. He doesn't care. He's just running. You know what I mean? Uh, we've all seen it. He doesn't run to first Jesus tells us to seek first. There is a priority to things. And priorities that are intentionally chosen are the, are the priorities that will succeed. If we don't set our priorities, the loudest voice, the most pressing problem, the, the, the culture's priorities, those will become our priorities. 
We need to set our priorities. We need to decide what is most important in our lives. All of us have priorities. The question is, who is setting them? It needs to be us. Seek first. The, joy, the road to joy is found in setting priorities and seeking God. Seek God, His kingdom, and His righteousness. We, we conquer busyness and we discover joy when God is first in our lives. Period. Now, putting God first in our lives doesn't mean that we don't still work hard, don't, we still study hard, and it doesn't mean we don't enjoy pursuits in our recreation, it doesn't mean we don't spend time with our family or watch a little TV at night. Putting God first in everything is the proper perspective, and we no longer find our worth in filling our calendars with so much stuff. Is God first in our lives? Is worship a priority? Is time in the Word, prayer, a priority? Is study with other believers, is time in community with other believers a priority? Those those aren't things that we have to add to an already full schedule. Those are the most important things that everything else needs to work around. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Lives that are scheduled around God as our priority, can you even imagine what that would look like? I can tell you one thing that would change for sure. We would start enjoying His blessings. All the things that really matter in life, like joy, will be given to you. That's the promise of Jesus. When God is first in our lives, the things that matter the most in our life will be given to us. Our needs will be supplied. The fruit of the Spirit will grow in abundance. Joy will overflow. That doesn't mean that life's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be any problems. It doesn't mean that there'll be no tragedies. It doesn't mean that there'll be no disappointments. But even in those times, God will be our joy. The challenge today is not to look at our busy schedules and see what needs to go. The challenge today is to look at our busy schedules and soberly ask if God is the number one priority in all that we do. If He is not, then busyness will rob you of joy. If this is something you need to work on, I again would encourage you to turn to the Psalms. Psalms 51 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. There are a lot of things that stand in the way of our quest for joy, but joy is attainable when we seek first our Heavenly Father. Today, in our time, for our time of invitation, I just want to encourage you to be praying about the joy in your life. And if you're finding that joy is absent, then I just want to encourage you to pray about your relationship with God. Is He a priority in your life? Because the joy of the Lord is there for each and every one of us today. If you're struggling with uh, joy, uh, make that a matter of prayer and ask Him to show you those places in, in your life uh, that need to that, that he needs to be the priority. Maybe you have joy. Maybe you're experiencing joy. You say, you know, Rick, I got a life of joy. It's great. Then I would encourage you to mentor someone or find someone who doesn't have that joy and share with them the joy of the Lord that's in your life. We all we are either needed or we have it. But this world def- desperately needs it, don't they? And so today, if, uh, if that's something with the life of joy that you need to be working on, I want to encourage you, challenge you to do that. If you need to make a public decision for Christ, I'll be here at the front to talk with you about that, to pray with you about that today. But let's stand and let's sing the song that Tracy has prepared for us.
I surrender all. Ah, that's hard. But Jesus promises when you surrender it all to him, he will bring you joy in this life. Even the joy in the midst of pain, joy in the midst of tragedy, you'll have the joy of the Lord. So I surrender all to him today. I pray that that, I hope that's all of our prayers today. Um, It's so good to worship with you here on this Memorial Day weekend. I do hope that you have a safe Memorial Day and that you spend some time tomorrow uh, bowing your head and expressing your gratitude to God for the lives that have made what we do in this place uh, possible. And so that's a good thing uh, for us to do as a nation and certainly as a church. A couple of announcements, uh, just to remind you, uh, this is the last Sunday of our Children Ministry Recruitment uh, Month. We're going to keep on recruiting until we have all the workers we need. Uh, But out here in the lobby today is our our big poster with all the things that are needed. So stop by that table and let them know that you are willing to consider, uh, pray about, uh, helping in children's ministry. It is the most important ministry we do as a church. And so we need uh, need your help. Uh, Seriously, we need your help. Uh, I told you a couple weeks ago that there was a $100,000 signing bonus. I was a little off on that. Um, actually, what you get, if you go over there and, and talk to them about it, they'll give you a 100, uh, 100 grand bar. Is that what it's called? A 100 grand bar? It's a little chocolate. Anyway, that's just as good as $100,000. So uh, stop over there and they'll give you some, some wonderful candy. Uh, and then second of all, I want to just cl- uh, kind of clear up some stuff. Uh, on June, June 12th, uh, Fairmount's going to be hosting the uh, Fishers of Men uh, Banquet and Program. And that name kind of makes it sound like it's a men's event. It is not. Now, Fishers of Men is just an organization. Uh, I bet Kevin can tell you a whole lot more about it. A sportsman organization that, uh, that uh, encourages ministry through, the, through, through fishing. Um, but uh, we're going to have a fish fry on June 12th. And all of you are invited to that, whether you even like, uh, like going fishing or not. We we don't care. Uh, we just want to have a good fellowship dinner. So that is on June 12th. Uh, that does cost 10 bucks, and you do, need, you do need to sign up for that ahead of time. So call the church office or get online and register for that. Then the program afterwards is totally free. You can just show up for that if you want to. Uh, there will be a great speaker and great encouragement for all of us to be out there fishing for men, as Jesus said, uh, fishing for folks who need to know Jesus. So, uh, so I hope you can come to that. Uh, we enjoy these fellowship meals together. Mike Banton's going to cook a, you know, 10 thousand pieces of fish. It'll be awesome. And so you don't want to miss that. So sign up, come to the meal, and stay for the great program. That's uh, two Sundays from today. All right, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you for this uh, precious time that we have together as a family, um, as a church, as a community, and as a nation. Lord, we all come into this place today to worship your name. We don't take that for granted. We don't take it lightly. May we leave this place more Uh, Lord, more eager to exhibit joy in our lives, and may we give that joy to some folks who so desperately need it. Our world needs joy, Lord. They need joy in you. May we show it and may we share it with them. In Jesus' name, amen.